George Daniels is a genius, one of the very few men in the world who can make a watch by hand from start to finish. For the last 30 years, he's been involved in an obsessive quest to develop the most accurate mechanical wristwatch ever made. Amongst watchmakers, he is legendary. My first introduction to watches was um, at the age of five, when I um, somehow or other acquired a watch. I don't know where it came from, it's a cheap watch. And I got into it, and in that watch case, I saw what was to me the center of the universe. It had a curious um, completeness. It, um, the content started at one end with the mainspring and uh, proceeded in a circle around the inside of the case to the vibrating balance wheel. And it was a complete composite world and uh, didn't seem to need any assistance from outside. It was perfectly happy to work quietly away in its closed case. If I had no tools, I would undo screws with pen knives and poke the watches with knitting needles. But there were several people living nearby whom I had to avoid every day because I'd had their clock to repair and ruined it. Didn't want them to know. So it was a bit anxious at times. George first made a name for himself as an expert on repairing antique clocks and watches. It was very uh, demanding. Uh, because the work had to be first class. There are many, many critics around, and I can assure you when um, a watchmaker puts an eyeglass into his eye to examine something that another watchmaker has made, he's not looking for an opportunity to praise that man. He's looking for imperfections. There's a curious introversion among the average watch repairer that uh, the finish and the shine uh, are the most important aspects of it. It's got to be impeccable. There must be no evidence that this component or watch was ever made. It's got to look as if it were created out of the atmosphere. In 1968, George began work on the first of a series of pocket watches. I was first provoked to make watches by the introduction of the quartz watch. And all the adulation that followed this, mainly directed towards encouraging the public to believe that the mechanical watch was dead. And this was the new era of electronic timekeeping and the only way forward. And I was furious because I'd spent all my life devoted to mechanical watches. And now these damned electricians had come along and tried to tell me uh, that uh, they could do it better. For two years, he locked himself away in his workshop handcrafting every single component, perfecting his art. And one finds that one is shaping these components according to the natural laws of the universe. For example, you would never attach any component by its thin end so that the thick end was doing the work away from the attachment. If you look at a tree, the branches are thicker at the root than they are at the tip, and that's a natural thing. The higher you go, the thinner it gets, and therefore uh, the weight is not proportional to the length, otherwise it would fail. Mechanics are the same. Mechanics can be very, very elegant. And when they're elegant, you analyze them and you find they're following natural laws, and thus have a natural beauty. He sold his first pocket watch for £1,900. By 1980, it was worth 100000 But George still wasn't satisfied. I realised that while the pocket watches were a great success and very much in demand, I was never going to make a fundamental impression on the watchmaking industry by producing anachronistic watches. And therefore, I must turn to wristwatches if I'm to reach my ultimate goal of introducing new ideas into watch manufacturing. His obsessive search for watchmaking perfection began to focus on devising a new form of escapement. The escapement is the ticking heart of a watch, combination of wheels and levers which makes it run on time. 
All the great watchmakers had come up with their own designs, but for the last 250 years, the lever escapement had reigned supreme, even though it had a fundamental flaw, oil. It couldn't remain accurate without constant lubrication, but the oil which kept it running also tended to clog up the mechanism. I realized that if I could invent another form of escapement that didn't require lubrication, then I could put up as good a performance as the quartz watch. Not in the short term, because the quartz will always beat the mechanical in the short term, but in the long term, my watch, I predicted, would run for 15 or 20 years. After five years of constant experimentation, George made a breakthrough, devising an escapement which didn't need oil. The difference between this and the um, conventional escapement occurs because there is now no rubbing action between the escape wheel, the impulsing wheel, and the oscillator. There is simply a gentle push as this tooth falls onto that pallet and gently pushes it aside. It's just like pushing open a gate, no friction involved at all. Whereas in the conventional escape, when there's a huge sliding action as the wheel passes the locking pallets. In 1975, George built his prototype wristwatch, but it took a further 25 years to convince the Swiss watchmaking industry that his new escapement could be mass produced. We had ludicrous situations where I took a watch and, and a drawing and showed them how it worked. And they said, oh, well, you know, it's too complicated. And in any case, we don't make pocket watches. So I went home and got a wristwatch and put the same escapement in the wristwatch, took it back. And they said, oh, well, we make thinner wristwatches. So I went home and got a very thin wristwatch, put a newly modified escapement, but that was, I mean, for some reason, they couldn't accept it. And then they did try to make it and failed, so therefore it was no good. There was no question of them failing. It must be me. And it went on like that for 15 years. The first batch of Swiss-made escapements will appear on the market this year. And one day, all mechanical watches may feature the Daniels escapement. Three tiny components, the culmination of a life's work. If I don't have any more new ideas at all in watchmaking, I don't mind. I've done everything I wanted, succeeded in everything I set my mind to. Einstein said that one man in his lifetime can comprehend only one philosophy. When he's done his best, he leaves it to others to continue. I'm perfectly happy with that. And the time season continues on Wednesday evening here on BBC Two with Clockwatch at half past nine and then explore the passing of time at 20 to 10.